Hello, 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 and welcome, my Meron Kimili. We are DM25, a radical political movement for Europe, and this is another live discussion with our coordinating team featuring subversive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. And today we're talking about green politics. Not so long ago, the term green had a much more radical meaning, and a vote for the Greens was a vote for climate justice, for non-violence, and for grassroots democracy. But today, with green parties in government in eight countries across Europe, the picture is very different. Green, po po nah, green politicians defending coal mining in Germany, setting police on climate protesters of all ages, green politicians embracing sanctions, apartheid regimes and NATO, jacking up military spending, leading the charge for war in Ukraine and pushing for a new Cold War on China and Russia. Green politicians splitting off from the grassroots movements that helped them get elected. And all the while, the word green is being co-opted frantically by corporations and decision makers across the spectrum, making it almost meaningless and slowing down material progress in favor of symbolic moves and feel good gestures. So how do we get here? Has green politics become decoupled from economic, social and democratic justice? Or is this just realpolitik in action? And what, of course, can we do about it? Our panel, including our own Yanis Varoufakis and our crew of activists and thinkers and doers from across Europe, will be weighing in on this and you, you out there watching us on YouTube. If you've got thoughts, comments, opinions, rants, anything you want to say on this topic, just put it in the YouTube chat and we'll put it to our panel. Let's kick off with David Castro now from the belly of the beast in Brussels. David. Thank you, Mehran. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight on YouTube. Um, let me pre preface my remarks about today's topic by telling you a little bit about me. I'm Portuguese, but in 2003, the economic crisis in my country, mainly due to the impact of the euro, changed the direction of my family forever. My father lost his job, my mother was clinically depressed and unable to work, and my brother had to abandon his studies to make ends meet at home. I was able to migrate with my mother to the UK when I was 12 to join my father, and I grew up in pre-Brexit Britain, in some of the poorest, roughest regions in the country. This wasn't the England of love, actually, but the This is England of Shane Meadows, for those who have seen that uh, brilliant film. It was certainly an educational experience, and we missed Portugal, my brother, and our extended family terribly. Yet this move also gave me the chance to go to university, which has led me to where I am today, working in Brussels and carrying over £30,000 worth of student debt. So when the M25 was created in February 2016, I immediately felt Here's a movement that actually speaks to me. I read their proposals at the time before I joined and saw how they could tackle the kinds of issues that had affected my family and millions of others, like the crisis of involuntary underemployment and involuntary migration. So I signed up and I've been working with them ever since. But before I joined the M25, I had worked in the center of the Brussels machine at the interface of business and green politics. And this experience is what I'd like to talk to you about today. I was employed by an organization called CSR Europe, the leading European business network for corporate sustainability and responsibility. And it gave me a masterclass of how propaganda it works in practice, I tell you. For example, every year, we organize meetings between executives from corporate giants like Huawei, IBM, NL, just to name a few, with European commissioners. The purpose, besides unofficial lobbying behind closed doors, obviously, was to get the commissions, commissioners to rubber stamp the sustainability reports of those companies quite publicly. Reports that were financed, <laughs> hear this, by the companies themselves. We created initiatives like the European Pact for Youth under the high patronage of His Majesty, the King of the Belgians, and with high level support of Donald Tusk, president of the European Council at the time, Martin Schulz, the president of the European Parliament at the time, and George Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission at the time. On the surface, the Pact for Youth was a program to improve partnerships between business and education in order to boost the chances of young people getting jobs. But in reality, what it did was provide a cheap labor force for corporate giants through underpaid and unpaid traineeships and apprenticeships, effectively turning universities into conveyor belts for the job market. CSI Europe was a slick greenwashing operation. Everyone who worked there believed they were doing something good helping to bring about more sustainable solutions for our planets, yet all they were really doing was serving corporate interests. They were legitimizing and perpetuating a broken system and they never, ever questioned it. 
Throughout my work in Brussels, I also saw this kind of greenwashing extended to politicians in Brussels. Look at the European Commission and its use of terms like green and sustainable. It's enough to make one's stomach churn. Yet, um, sorry, one, I, I lost my train of thought there. Um, the Commission's uh, Green Deal and the Beyond the Growth Conference being just two recent examples, not to mention the so-called recovery plan, recovery for whom it's pure naked co-optation. And now I come to the Greens themselves. I want to say this first. After we announced today's live stream topic, I read a few comments from former comrades of ours complaining that we were daring to attack the Greens when we ourselves failed to re-enter Parliament in Greece in the latest election just a few weeks ago. Other comments pointed to the fact that the green politics exists outside of Austria and Germany. My message to them is this. Yes, we did fail to convince enough people to vote for us in the last election. We have no problem whatsoever admitting it. But there's a follow-up coming up, and you bet we're doing our best to make it happen again. But the point I want to make is the following one. There is a gigantic difference between a political party not achieving backing for its ideas during an election and a political party already having enough backing for its ideas and then entering parliament, forming a government, and then doing a U-turn on those ideas. And that is what I'm criticizing. In the same way that we as DM and as Meta must have the capacity to accept our own shortcomings sometimes, it would do well for the Greens to have some humility and do the same. Because all Democrats, regardless of party affiliation, have a duty to stand up for democracy, for the people, and for the planet. Whenever we see political parties that are meant to fight for those things and instead do the opposite when in power, because they're so obsessed with power at any cost, we must call them out. Whether they are green, socialist, it really doesn't matter because they're supposed to be better than that. Didn't we witness precisely this behavior with the euro crisis? So many mistakes that made by an arrogant self-centered establishment that couldn't take a tiny wee bit of criticism for what it was doing. An establishment so fragile that the mere insinuation that what it was doing to the pigs was wrong led to the doubling down of its position on austerity. Now, I know plenty of people work for the Greens, you know, most of them are lovely people. My criticism really isn't towards them. It's towards the leadership of most, not all, but most Green parties. With that said, if the Greens are green today, then I think I must be going colorblind. Is it green to raise villages to the ground like they're doing in Lutzerath in Germany, like they've, done, like they've done in Lutzerath in Germany, where they are in power in order to have more coal mining? Is it green to ally with fascist parties like the Greens have done in Austria, while the world is careening towards the crucial 1.5 degrees Celsius mark in the average global temperature rise? And when it comes to world affairs, is it really green to be pro-war and to label people campaigning for peace, campaigning for peace, comrades, as Putin apologists? And looking at the Greens in Finland and Belgium too, last year in Finland, Green NGOs sued the Finnish government over carbon neutrality goals. And in Belgium, just last week, I was reading about it, centrist Prime Minister Alexander de Croo came out and said that he's in favor of putting a pause on any green legislation because it might threaten to destroy Belgian industry, following in the footsteps of Emmanuel Macron in France. And in response to his statements, his own federal climate minister, Zakia Katabi, former leader of the Greens here in Belgium, came out and criticized his position, saying that it isn't, quote, the government's position, nor the Belgian one. I honestly don't know whether to cry or, or, or laugh when I hear these things. He's the prime minister of her own government. And again, if you look at the Greens in Sweden, from 2014 to 2018, they held a total of eight ministries and were widely seen as failing to fulfill key promises such as a reduction of the working week and the closure of Broma, Stockholm Airport. And then you have the Irish Greens who are in a coalition government with two right-wing conservative parties. Do you know the, the examples are numerous? It isn't just Germany and it isn't just Austria. The Greens have ridden the green wave generated by movements like Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future and so on, only to increase the risk of our extinction with their wrong-headed policies. It's not bad intentions here, it's just sheer incompetence. This is where the Greens are today. They have put themselves entirely at the mercy of corporate interests. They have lost their spine and forgotten their roots. They have entered into governments that are doing all they can to destroy the planet, planet and people's hard fought rights. And they're complicit in all this because like my colleagues before in CSR Europe, they legitimize and perpetuate a broken system. They never ever question what they're doing. So if you really want to know the kind of radical climate policy, that would fi fix all these things that I've been talking about. It is the Green New Deal for Europe, 
from the M25. And, if, and the only thing that it requires, believe it or not, to be put into practice are people in power willing to do it. It's quite as simple as that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yanis, what is yours? Thanks, David. Thanks, Madam. Look, I'm going to go soft on the Greens. I'm not going to be very harsh on them because uh, they are not the only radicals or reformists uh, who lost their mantle, who lost their way, who lost or sold their souls once in government. Uh, every radical who has shifted to government so far, unfortunately, with very few exceptions, maybe Che Guevara, right? <laughs> um, has gone down the, that road. The communists, when they took over in 1917, after the October, the magnificent October Revolution, well, very soon after that, they drifted to authoritarianism, they forgot socialism, as Noam Chomsky correctly says, and they went towards a collectivism, a state capitalist route. Uh, the, you know, the Social Democrats, who did a lot of work in the 19, late 60s and 70s to rebalance in, uh, the, the distribution of income and the distribution of power between capital and labor. Well, the moment Bretton Woods died in 1971 and financialization hit, the Social Democrats in government were the worst, the worst. They invented austerity. They destroyed the working class in the name of the working class in cahoots with the financial sector. Um, we here in Greece, you know, we stood tall against the Troika in 2011, 2012 uh, with Syriza. Uh, we entered government, we fought valiantly for a few months. And then after that, the same party uh, not only collaborated, not only was co-opted by the toxic Troika establishment, uh, but they imposed the worst austerity in the history of the world upon the people who elected them to fight against austerity. So the fact that the Greens have um, done the same, sold out, um, means that we should be nuanced. We Marxists, leftists, and so on, uh, we should uh, ask the question, the broader question, why is it that radicals who find themselves in government um, end up changing themselves rather than changing the world? That, I think, is the bigger question. And I think the answer to that has to do with capitalism and the way that capital in the end wins. If you don't challenge capital's reign over people, if you don't challenge the property rights, which undermine and underpin the whole power game, then um, even if you have the best of intentions, and I have no doubt that the Greens, like Syriza, you know, we had good intentions when we entered parliament when we entered government. Uh, that's my preface, <laughs> that I'm going to go easy on them. Uh, but now let me go back to the basics about green politics. Now, what is green politics? Since I talked about capitalism, we are all products of the, trans the great transformation, as Karl Polanyi described, the transition from feudalism to capitalism. That transformation meant that essentially uh, exchange value triumphed over experiential value. That sounds a bit philosophical, so let me break it down. Uh, there used to be a time when um, things had a value that was separate from its price. Uh, even, you know, in authoritarian regimes in the Middle Ages, you know, let me give you an example. Uh, the landed gentry would inherit the land from their... From, Usually it was, you know, usually it was, you know, from father to son, but the son would never think of selling the land, never. Uh, it would be treachery, treachery to the very principles of the landed gentry of feudalism, uh, to say, ah, oh, well, you know, don't be a feudal lord. I want to sell out, uh, get money for my land, and you know, go to to the Bahamas or wherever and have a nice time. It just wasn't done. There were some things whose value was much more significant than its price. Um, and you have, with capitalism, you have this constant imperialism of prices destroying values. First with the enclosures, uh, then with uh, property. You have the commodification of labor. Under you know, feudalism, slave 
societies, uh, labor was not a commodity. It was exploited, it was enslaved, but it was not commodified. People were commodified, labor was not commodified, there were no wages. You know, if you had slaves, serfs, you didn't pay them wages. They simply, you simply took a large part of the produce that they produced. Uh, so you, capitalism is the, that's the, the main point I want to make. Think of it as a virus that takes over everything that doesn't have a price and has a value and gives it a price. That is immensely important regarding the environment. Because, you know, uh, you know what they say about GDP, why GDP sucks as a measure of, um, of, 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 of well-being. Uh, you burn down a forest, GDP goes up. Why? Because the forest has no price. The tree has no price. It gets burned down. GDP doesn't go down. But the diesel fuel, the fire engine uses in order to pretend to extinguish the forest, you know, that is expended and that's added to GDP. And suddenly, you know, the forest fire um, doesn't deplete the wealth of the nation according to GDP measurements, right? Now, why is it? Because the tree has not been commodified yet. So if you think about it, capitalism goes into nature, takes over crucial values, environmental values, biological values, biodiversity, you know, it has no price for capitalism, so its destruction is not a cost. To the extent that its destruction gives us one dollar or gives the capitalist one dollar, this is a good thing. It increases GDP. Okay. Um, now, Marxism was a challenge to the idea that capitalism is equivalent to progress. It's that amount of prog progress. Yes, the creation of a steam engine is progress, but no. It doesn't mean that the use of the steam engine by the capitalist is going to enhance the human condition. According to the Marxist analysis, the, if it is owned by one person and then worked by many, and that one person uses the ownership of the steam engine in the mine, in the textile factory, in the car factory, whatever, in order to extract surplus value from the worker that he doesn't pay for, no? because his power due to the unequal property rights over the steam engine, then that creates massive misery amongst the workers and misery in the spirit and the heart of the capitalist, because he ends up being a sad bastard in the end of the day, the day, constantly worrying about bankruptcy, constantly worrying that one day he may end up being a proletarian. So Marx is you know, effectively challenging the notion that technological change and progress is progress for humanity to the extent that we lose the opportunity to value things in ways that are separate from their price. And then you have the Soviet Union, a Soviet planning, which in the name of the working class, to create goods and services and food and shelter for the workers, it continues along the lines of uh, not valuing trees not valuing biodiversity, not valuing the things that can not be converted immediately into utility for the working class. And that's where the Green Movement comes in, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, challenging, challenging on a humanistic basis, if you want on a class basis, the notion that whatever contributes to the growth of goods and services for the working class is necessarily a good thing for the working class. So when the German Greens emerged in the 1970s, okay, they were challenging as radicals capitalism. And they were also challenging the notion that state capitalism in the Soviet Union or you know, Soviet planning was indeed a fundamental departure from the depletion of the things that can make human humanity progress in a genuine way. So in that way, the, the Greens were a very radical movement, a movement that was a breath of fresh air, a movement that slapped across the face the Social Democrats and the Communists, rightly so, reminding them that they had been caught up in a kind of laborism, that whatever good was good for wage labor was good for society, without wanting to give workers the ownership and the control of the production process, a production process which was 
creating some values but destroying other values that capitalism had rendered valueless. That was the, the early stage of, of the Greens. Uh, but of course, the moment they got into government with Joska Fischer, by the way, let me remind you because I'm a bit older, this is not the first time that the Greens are in government and it's not the first time that they are warmongers. The first bombing of a country in Europe uh, after the Second World War included aircraft of the German Air Force sent to Yugoslavia to bomb Yugoslavia by Joschka Fischer, the leader of the Green Party in Germany. So, you know, what's happening in Ukraine today is small fry compared to what happened in uh, the 1990s in, in Yugoslavia. Uh, but you see, the point is this. The moment you enter, whether you are Syriza or the Social Democrats or the Greek, you enter government and you accept the property rights over capital, of the capitalist class, right? Uh, thinking that you can use the instruments of the state, whatever levers the government allows you to play with as a politician, government minister, in order to arrest the progress of commodification and genuine value destruction, which is the essence of the capitalist beast, of the capitalist dyna dynamic. If you think that, if you believe that, that's it, you're finished. If you're, if you're the best person the, with, with the best meaning uh, agenda in the world. Um, I remember, and now I'm, I'm going to finish off on a personal basis. I remember in 2015 when I was a finance minister of Greece and I was in Berlin. A number of times I was in Berlin. And on one occasion, one day, after having locked horns with my nemesis, Wolfgang Schäuble, I remember after that I met with uh, the parliamentary par group of the Social Democrats, then separately, se separate meeting with the parliamentary delegation or group of the Greens, and then finally with uh, Die Linke, with the parliamentarians of Die Linke. Uh, with the parliamentarians of Die Linke, it, it went very well. They were comrades, they were supportive. I tell you, the worst meeting I had was with the Greens. The worst meeting I had, the ones that were most cynical about our attempt in Greece in 2015 to liberate the country from austerity, from debt bondage, from the imperialism of the Troika, which was demanding, by the way, the Troika was demanding that we go into bed with ExxonMobil, with Total, in order to have uh, you know, oil drilling, drilling and drilling for gas and pipelines. This is what was the Troika was pushing us to do. I was resisting it, right, when I was in Berlin. And the Greens were the ones that were most cynical about this resistance and who were undermining me more than anyone, more than Schäuble, more than um, the Social Democrats, more than any representative of the European Central Bank. Now, why was that? Were they bad people? Were they were the worst people? No, they weren't. They were actually, on a personal basis, quite cuddly and sweet. And I'm sure they rode bicycles around Berlin and they refused to, to get into diesel engine cars. And I'm sure they disdained the idea of sweatshops and the exploitation of labor and all that, all that. But I'll tell you what, what, what was the, the, the main reason why they were the worst of the worst. Because they were anxious. They were anxious that the establishment would consider them radical. They were in the business of leapfrogging over the Social Democrats. Remember, at the time, there was a coalition government between the Christian Democrats of Angela Merkel and Wolfgang Schäuble and the Social Democrats of Sigmund Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel. And the Greens were struggling to lift themselves in the opinion polls in the, and in the next general election above the Social Democrats to become a party of government. And it was in their sights that the only way of becoming a part of government was to leave it open to forming a coalition either with the Christian Democrats or with the Social Democrats. That was always going to be their game plan for getting power. Now, in their minds and hearts, they re legitimized them. They were saying, well, we need to get in there in order to stop nuclear powers, you know, to, to close down once and for all nuclear power stations, to, you know, build cycling lanes, to have more recycling to you know, move Germany away from lignite and coal. They, they, they had 
You know, if you, I have no idea that they were not thinking of themselves. I want to get in the government in order to, um, uh, to, 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 to dig, dig out of the earth more lignite or to, you know, to, to, to sell out and to sell my soul to the devil. No, no, no. They were thinking in practical terms, in terms of success, of political success. Here a little parenthesis, because David mentioned those who mock us and saying, oh, you, but you failed. You didn't get re-elected in this parliament on the 21st of May. You know, the assumption that success and somehow being right are connected, they're not. More often than not, if you're right, you don't succeed. More often than not. And it is our job as radicals, whether they were Marxists or Greens or whatever radicals, to be right, to say the right thing and to do the right thing independently of consequences. Because the moment we allow ourselves to be lured by success, we are the stooges of the worst and most toxic part of capitalism, of authoritarianism, of neo-fascism. Close bracket. So, the, so what, what happens is these people, you know, they start thinking strategically, tactically. How do we get into government, right? So they meet Varoufakis, who is resisting the Troika, in a media environment with their Spiegel, you know, fats and tats and mats and chats, right? And, the, the, you know, the various television channels that are demonizing Varoufakis. So they are fearful that if they cozy up to me, they will be demonized. So they're being ironic. And immediately, without even thinking about it, they become co-opted by Schäuble. So they become what I back then once quipped when talking to a friend of mine. I said, you know, they, when, I, when I was talking to them, suddenly they, they, they brought up the image of Schäuble with recycling. That's how green they were. Because they had adopted austerity, and now you can see they're adopting NATO, and they're adopting the, the, the Cold War. Because, you see, it's really very easy if you don't have a backbone, if you don't have an ideological anchorage, an anchor that binds you to what is right as opposed to what is expedient and what leads to success. It's very easy to say, okay, so where is the whole thing drifting? Um, NATO is winning. The Ukraine's war is happening. Putin is a, is a criminal, undoubtedly, right? So we'll go with the flow. We'll go with the flow. The flow is... You know, the Chinese are treating minorities terribly, which they are. Uh, they are oppressing the students of the Hong Kong Polytechnic, which they are. Legitimacy amongst the West for the Greens means going with the flow, with the NATO narrative, right? Instead of saying neither Putin nor NATO. Uh, that takes guts. But once you have opted for victory and you've left behind principle, you're gone. This is it. It's, you, you're you're on a, a landslide. You're on a you are riding not a wave, a tsunami. You can't go back. This is my view. Um, but again, I will finish off being soft on the greens. We leftists uh, can't point fingers at them more than we point our fingers to our Marxist friends, our social democrat friends, our you know anarcho syndicalist friends, because in the end, um, power corrupts. And if you are not prepared to give it up, to give up government, office, to resign, if you're not prepared to lose elections like we just lost on the 21st of May, then you're, gone. you're, you're a goner. Finally, let me confirm what David Castor said. Your comrades here in Greece, Mera 25, are working 20 hours a day, 20 hours a day, and also during the, the, the remaining four hours, we're in a kind of days and half sleep during which the, the mind subconsciously continues to work in order to um, revive the prospects of uh, a genuinely radical agenda here in Greece and make sure that this voice is returned to parliament. And we trust that we will. No guarantees, folks. Because again, we will not do whatever it takes. We are not going to do whatever it takes. If whatever it takes means selling out. Carpe diem. Thank you, Yenis. And uh, you just answered a question there that I was going to put to you, which someone asked, how can we guarantee as members of DM that we wouldn't find ourselves in the same position if we, as the Greens, if we were to come to power? But I think you just enunciated that very well. Um, a couple of other comments from the chat. Non Latifundia says, 
In the West, i.e. Canada, green politics has become green neoliberalism. Social considerations have taken a backseat to financial remedies for climate change. BDA says most greens are just eco-libertarians, unfortunately. Sunil gives us his uh, uh, personal experience. He says, I was a Green Party member for over a decade. I stood, I, over a decade. I stood for the Green Party in several general elections. When the Greens shifted to support membership of NATO, I left. And Rebel Wins says Greens is now just refers to the color of money. Dushan, Dushan Pajovic, our previously uh, Green New Deal for Europe coordinator, you had a lot of uh, connections with green decision makers, green activists. What's your take? Thanks, Mahan. Uh, first, to answer to the question about the M25 and how do we ensure that we wouldn't, we wouldn't get corrupted. Because the structure is so powerful in here. Uh, every major decision uh, that needs to be uh, held from the party needs to be approved by all member votes. And we have our, uh, our own organizing principles that cannot... Uh, be broken. So if you are part of this movement, uh, you shouldn't worry about that because uh, we even vote for as members who is going to be on the list of candidates. So you have the full democratic horizontal control over that. Regarding uh, the green issues, well, listen, money always finds its way to co corrupt, to co-opt, and everything else. So capitalism learned that they can play with uh, green ideas, with anti-racism ideas, with pro-LGBTQ ideas and so on, and strip them from the meaning. So they funded a lot of money towards NGOs, towards different parties that are never tackling the core issues. They are just talking about some cosmetic things and they are literally lying to you that everything can just change in a matter of second and you can just continue living as you were living and that's just not possible uh for example uh exxon mobile and shell are both really capable of adapting as well. That's why they have their own green energy sources to compete with their fossil fuel brigade as well. And uh, listen to what Jason Hickel said, to quote him now, clean energy might help deal with emissions, but it does nothing to reverse deforestation, overfishing, soil, soil depletion and mass extinction. A growth-obsessed economy powered by clean energy will still tip us into ecological disaster. So the whole system needs to change. We cannot just shift uh, our cars with electric cars and then some kids uh, in Africa are going to be digging for lithium batteries. That doesn't do anything. We need much, much more radical practices and Unfortunately, green became a bad word and they are trying to co-opt everything. Green New Deal, first of all, and now even post-growth, which is atrocity. And it all come, come back to the very same point, if you ask me, that uh, green ideas are now being presented as not necessarily anti-capitalism and uh, they are being marginalized from the other two main topics that are interconnected, which is economics and democracy. What I mean with that is that we need to completely shift our uh, way of production, but also and means of production, but also to completely change the energy that we are uh, emitting ourselves, not in esoteric terms, but in terms of how society operates. It operates on strongly patriarchal values, pro-war values. It operates on uh, exploitation of animals, of humans, of everyone else. We, if we want to call something green, we need to tackle it all with the combined means. So I think that some of the features that DM25 puts out would contribute to this. And those are four day work week. Those are uh, demilitarization, global demi demilitarization, 
abolishing animal agriculture, and so on and so on and so on, citizens' assemblies. Uh, so if you want to change something environmentally speaking, you need to tackle the other two crises as well, because only 10% of people in this world are emitting around 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. And if we don't worry about that, then we are in problem. Then we are just going to have green imperialistic capitalism, where some kids are going to be digging uranium in a global south where we are while we are driving fancy electric cars. And that is leading us into the global, global deep hole. Thank you, Dushan. Amir, Amir Kiai, our policy coordinator based in The Hague. Tell us what's on your mind on this topic. Yeah, thanks, Mayron. Um, uh, sort of trailing off from what Dushan was saying, I, I remember this um, statistic where um, average electricity use per capita in some parts of the global south per person per year is the same as a typical American fridge. So, uh, the um, you know, give, if you just think thinking of thinking of thinking of it from that statistical point of view, it's clear that. Uh, a significant reduction in uh, consumption is the way to go. Um, and even when we break it down by sector, with energy use being about 70% of overall greenhouse gas emissions. So the statistics actually points the way into where we need to make radical changes. And um, at the moment, we have the crowd editing of our Green New Deal for Europe policy. And a major component of that is introducing the provisions of the plant-based treaty which aims, aims to end industrial animal agriculture, which itself accounts for roughly, if we look at the whole uh, quote-unquote value chain of uh, slaughtering of animals, of about 20 to 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got some um, solutions, if you like, in our Green Deal for Europe, either existing or coming up. And people can, of course, um, inform themselves and read into that. Um, but let's also quickly touch on uh, something you know besides policy ideas and what um what uh, solutions can be put into place from my point of view we have to go and go back on what needs to be done now uh, by the by the by the public by us and with all this greenwashing and um, you know there's you know no institutional accountability anywhere really um the role of the public becomes even more important and let me just illustrate this as well on a more personal level uh, this um, past weekend, I was attending a protest um, in The Hague. Um, there was about 8,000 of us uh, demanding an end to subsidies for fossil fuels uh, in the Netherlands, which is a very reasonable demand and um, um, something that can be done right away, ending the subsidies. It's not too complicated because they're also ending, also cutting back on mental health care and so on uh, with a very quick effect. So that's not a problem. Um, but the amount of subsidies is so high to fossil fuel companies that ending it and using the money um, could be could make public transport completely free in the Netherlands. And I'm talking about trains, buses, metros, trams, water taxis, and so on. It can be made completely free and still have billions left over. That's how much we're subsidizing fossil fuel industry in the Netherlands. Um, so these are very reasonable demands, um, but uh, we were. We were dealing with, um, of course, the uh, system of power in this country doesn't support that. And the uh, authorities um, uh, sort of intervened quite rapidly in the protest. Um, I was amongst the nearly 1,600 people who were arrested during the uh, peaceful demonstration. And uh, we were briefly detained and then bused to the outskirts of the city, um, which was happens to be a football stadium. And there we were freed, um, and we of course made our way back and joined the uh, the demonstrators again. So um, being physically in the public spaces is is critical and paramount, and especially while we still have this liberty, because that liberty has also been taken away in other countries, in the UK, for example, in Australia, um, right to protest is becoming increasingly harder um, in Western Europe. 
never mind in the, the rest of the globe, which we of course know about, we've talked about before, Iran, etc. So our presence on the street and participation in demonstration and protest is not only there to speak out against injustice, uh, but also to strengthen network of activism uh, amongst us so that we can organize for a just future. That's very critical. Um, so it's not just a moral, but practical um, ask that we all have to do. Uh, we should then join protests and maintain the public presence in public spaces. Thank you, Amir. Just to loop it back to the Greens, and maybe you can respond, or maybe you do, Shem, before we move to Germany and the German Greens. Um, Yanis was talking about before how you know they, they lose their radicality once they're in power. And maybe that's because these are people who are not really suffering to begin with. I mean, I've always had this idea of Greens as a, um, you know, kind of yoga, muesli, organic food, but it's a bit of a lifestyle choice. You know that your politics is express, expressed as a lifestyle choice, green supporters. Am I am I right about that, or is that just some some crude stereotype? What, what who is their their primary base of voters in your experience, or or is it too varied to tell? Uh, well, should, I mean, or, or I mean, the, yeah, sure. In the Netherlands, I mean, the 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 Green Left Party has lost support. Um, it's moved to the you know the support base in. Uh, that they have has reduced by about 30 to 40 percent and um you know just also linking into the protest um there's you know i went on the twitter feed early on in preparation as well for this for tonight and uh there's no mention made of the of the protest by the public um so in that sense you know maybe that answers your question in that way that maybe for them their audience is somewhere else May I just add one thing? Uh, that's a good analysis, but also depends where. You know, in uh, Montenegro, it's radically different. They are even worse than that. It's the worst part. One of the worst part is here. And uh, I would just to have one strong note for our viewers. This doesn't apply for the UK Greens and our friend and comrade Caroline Lucas, who's the very, very close to DM's policy, and we strongly endorse her, I'd say, as well, in her fight. Thank you, Dushan. Important point there. We're talking about the green, I mean, green politics. It's a green family, and there are many different uh, parties involved in that. Um, a take from Brussels here that I, I'm quite right, judging by Brussels. There are hipsters everywhere. I haven't met a working class green yet here. <laughs> so maybe that, that does back up that view. Okay, let's move to Germany. Um, which, if I understand correctly, is the most successful Green Party ever, anywhere. Um, and now that they're in government, as Yanis mentioned, not for the first time, they're betraying their principles, or at least it seems so. Johannes, Johannes Fair, Berlin, what's your take on that? Thank you all. Um, I want to start with a question from the chat, which was, what is a progressive pragmatic roadmap for smooth transition from fossil fuels energy to green energy from Sala, Salman Ali Ahmad Malik, uh, nice name. Um, and I think, I don't know, I don't know any smooth transition that is possible anymore, I think, uh, nowadays, um, and especially if you want to really change things, I think you need to, as uh, speakers before me have already explained, you need to tackle actually the ownership of energy production and also the profit model that goes with it. Because if you want to have a sustainable system, the goal of profit will always be, you know, different than the goal of actually having sustainable energy for the many, uh, for all of us. And um, so I think that is also a major mistake if you look at the German Greens, um, what they are basically given up quite some time ago already. And, um, you know, in Germany, we have a federal state and in the south of Germany, the Greens are quite strong for a longer time already. They are um, having, a, you know, leading the government even in, in, in one state in Baden-Württemberg. And there you can really see a very, you know, by now conservative party that tries to change things a little bit into green, into the direction of green energy, but is not, you know, tackling the ownership question at all anymore. And that is also true for the movement of the whole party in Germany, though I have to be honest, I still would argue they are 
you know, in our government that calls itself a progressive government, the Greens are still somehow the most progressive part. But of course, this government has last year decided to spend 100 billion euros on the military instead of actually, you know, taking maybe the last chance to invest a lot of money into a green energy transition and is not at all, you know, um, tackling the, the question of ownership of energy production um, in the fossil fuel area and neither in the, in the green area. Um, also, they have moved to, you know, build up huge LNG, liquefied gas um, import infrastructure that is actually, studies have shown, is much too big um, and, uh, yeah, will, you know, bring a lot more LNG than we actually need to transition away from uh, Russian gas after the uh, pipeline was uh, blown up and the terrorist act um, that we all already also uh, spoke about. Um, also recently, they had a scandal in the um, economic ministry, which they are running. Uh, the ministers, uh, Mr. Habeck from the Greens, he had a secretary of state that was involved in choosing someone for the German energy agency, a new head. And it turned out that this guy that he was involved choosing was also a friend from school days um, and uh, had his best man at the, at the wedding. Um, so this is a scandal that comes from the side um, at the same time as the Greens were actually trying to introduce a law to um, have from the 1st of January next year, have every um, heating system that is installed in Germany with, run with at least 65% of renewable energy and completely end fossil fuel heating by 2044. This is, you know, something, a direction in general that is, uh, you know, necessary because we need to change to heat pump um, heating in Germany and away from fossil fuels. But of course, how they, are they doing it in this government with the Social Democrats and the Liberals? They kind of keep the model of giving a little bit of subsidy, like 30% for if you change your fossil fuel heating system with an um, eco-friendly one. Um, but new houses, for example, don't get the necessary subsidies. And as I mentioned before, last year, they spent 100 billion uh, on the military, which they could have spent on the seating pump, uh, heat pump um, subsidies to help house owners to actually do this transition, which is necessary. So as always, it's kind of like, you know, on the surface, trying to uh, change a little bit. And um I want to end on something that is actually, I think also from the chat, I feel like green is becoming another scary word, something at the cost of the working people to benefit the environment. I feel like certain people connected with elitism and that is the core problem or the core where this is coming from. So the right-wing media spins it in this way is also because the green politics is unfortunately not tackling you know, the ownership of energy. Uh, system production, for example, which they should, and which certainly in our program, um, there is a much more radical vision, um, which then, of course, means that you don't will not have support, for example, of mainstream media when going to government. You will have them against you, as we also saw in Greece, for example. Thanks. Thank you, Johannes. You, you've gone very gentle on the German Greens, relatively speaking. Juliana, would you like to twist the knife <laughs> uh thank you Mahalan. um well the problem is with twisting the knife is really that almost everyone in germany is twisting the knife with the greens but the problem is the big big problem is that they are criticized for something completely different that we are criticizing them for i mean one big takeaway from seeing the greens in government for us um is for sure that the majority of German society is not prepared for a transition, uh, for progressive polit politics. And the fossil fuel conservative uh, politics, the fossil fuel industry, conservative pol politics, neoliberals have really turned on their machine in form of media, in form of disinformation campaigns. And uh, right now, yes, I think many people uh, see green politics as something that is 
super affordable for rich people uh, and is going to ruin everyone else. It's not working class politics. And when it comes to who is electing the Greens, it's not working class people. Um, what I think the Greens are doing very wrong from the beginning is that they have never approached any communication with the people. They are hiding behind the other parties, you know, we cannot do that because the FTP is standing in our way. We cannot do that because the SPD is doing that. Uh, they are letting this, as I said, this whole fossil fuel machinery take uh, to take the stage uh, and scare the people about every single policy. They're not able to step up and say, well, yes, it's going to be expensive, but we will make sure that people are not being left behind. There's no approach in that way. And I think in 10 or 15 years, we will look back at this period in Germany and we will see that this is a historical failure of the Greens. Because after the 90s, this is their comeback. This is their second chance, actually. And it so happens that they are the Green Party. And this is why the Fridays for Future, Parents for Future, all the climate activists gave them a chance because they thought, OK, this is, this is the party we have to historically go for now. After 16 years of CDU, after I, I mean, we have to admit that the CDU didn't do anything for the future of the country. There was no, there was no preparation for a future and renewable energy and so on. So, so now is really the time to do everything that needs to be done. And now, watering down every policy um, will be will lead. To what actually? To whatever is done now by the Greens, which is just a bit in every direction, will be it for the next decade because at the next elections, they won't come up as first. I'm quite sure. The CDU, the Conservatives, will probably come back into government because in four years, the people will be scared so much of green policies and green politics that they, as we see it in Greece with Mitsotakis and in every country with Conservatives in right when going into government, the same will happen in Germany um, if the narrative is evolving into this direction. And then we will have, again, backwards thinking politics for a few years, and we will fall behind in Germany on renewable energy, on everything, uh, quite a bit. So, so I guess that is turning the knife, because I think this is a historical failure of, of the party. Okay. Thank you, Juliana. Daphne, Daphne Del Cara, okay. based in France. <laughs> hey, uh, where there is also a Green Party, of course. Please, yeah, tell us. Well, I'm actually not going to talk about the Green Party per se. I, I would like to touch upon something that's been multiply, multiple times mentioned, and that Yanis started talking about about how uh, why green politics first emerged. Uh, which was like the failure of both camps, be it the capitalist camp or the, like during the Cold War, uh, the, the socialist camp to uh, ignore the social cost of the uh, loss of environments um, uh, and um, ecosystems and uh, because there was no value assigned to them. And that starting point is, I think, important because now, and I come back to the question of, why is green politics never working class? Or why is green politics always um, stuck on this very um, upper middle class, um, almost elitist um, uh, fringe? And why is the greens, why have the greens become uh, warmongers? So I think these three questions are all, all very related to each other. And I think this comes from the first, even the initial part where you say, we are above ideology, we have a common goal to create, create uh, uh, to protect nature, and that should be enough, which is never enough. This is a very, very, um, very naive uh, way of thinking of, about the world. And as we know that the moment people start to think they're above ideology, they reproduce the dominant ideology without uh, noticing it. And the other thing is that because um, of this uh, being aware of the environmental destructions in a global scale, scale comes from like a certain amount of knowledge, so usually a university degree and all this, uh, it became really stuck into this class 
that is very uh, like knowledge producing class, let's say, but a knowledge producing class that thinks it is above ideology and not only above ideology that rejects, has positioned itself against socialist uh, working class politics. Like we forget that the just transition was initially uh, trade union demand. This is where the first just transition uh, framework uh, was born. Uh, and I think, and then coming into the 90s, uh, it becomes like even more solidified because if you have a professional, well-educated uh, group of people that think they're above ideology, and then they come to the moment where the world becomes post-ideological and the history and all that, and uh, that you have no working class constituency. Because I think another very big important question is, who is the Greens constituency? Who are they accountable to? And that's not the vast majority of people. And all these three things become aligned and that's why this technocratic way the Greens have defined themselves has um, aligned so well with the technocratic European Union. That's why there is like such a European EU party and EU thinking and they're because the EU by structure is also so technocratic. And I think uh, then they become more in, uh, involved in an establishment, an institutional framework, and that institutional framework is pro-capitalism, inevitably. And this and capitalism is pro-hegemony, and there they become pro-war. Like, for example, in the Beyond Growth Conference, one of the <laughs> shocking things to me is that everybody talked a lot about anti-capitalism, how capitalism is destroying uh, the, the planet, but at no point was the word dollar mentioned ever. And what was mentioned though, there was a very interesting talk by uh, somebody from Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carnegie, no, Car Carnegie Europe, sorry, <laughs> uh, that uh, had a long talk about how China is so evil because they uh, control these, these, these minerals and this should terrify us all. And uh, they're gonna kill us all and we should uh, be against China. Uh, and this talk got like lots of uh, uh, applause. And another moment that I thought was very revealing was uh, a panel on economic models where uh, there was this person from the IPCC's economical panel that uh, I'm gonna get a bit technical, my apologies here, but they started by saying they're not ideological and that everybody in this conference is so ideological. Uh, they're like scientific, and then they proceeded by um, by uh, defending uh, one of the IPCC economists who had got who's got a uh, Nobel Prize for the famous Nordhaus model uh, that is basically a neoclassical model that <laughs> was so uh, like entrenched in like climate denial that uh, it is shocking that anybody would uh, like defend that. And then we should be, and then she finished by saying, this person was trying their best. This person is like a big neoliberal economist, a neoclassical economist. And that got, because it was a friendship and a nice humanistic message, that got a big applause because the Greens have also not only declared themselves anti-ideological, they have lost all curiosity about the ideologies and the economic critiques these different ideologies present. You might not agree, I'm not saying that everybody should adhere to an ideological, like we should all become dogmatic orthodox Marxist or something like that. But like this comes over and over, like rejecting ideology is actually creating this uh, ignorance. Uh, and uh, I think these are the core problems that define not only the green parties, but I think the green mo movements in general. So uh, I guess this is my two cents. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, the, the moment people start to think they're above ideology, they reproduce the dominant ideology. Well said. Um, we're getting close to the top of the hour, but we've got one more speaker before we close. Ivana, Ivana Ninadovic from Serbia. Go for it. Yeah, because I'll be, I'll be wrapping up. Um, I would like to end with uh, how do we in DM25 
help with the clarifying all of these valuable issues and the points of view that we heard tonight. And uh, not to make it just about criticizing the Green Party, because it's not about that at all. It's just that they are the leaders of the green politics, so to say. And uh, a lot has been said here, but uh, for me as, as a non-expert on green politics, transition and so on, it seems like uh, for the left, it goes without saying that we are for the green transition, green politics and so on. However, I think that we need more uh, conversations and deb debates within the membership as well to clarify what are our uh, proposals and how not to scare off people uh, that are being intimidated by the means of the radical green activists, which is usually counterproductive for the average Joe. And uh, people are trying to uh, meet their ends every day and talking about going vegan, which is very expensive, especially in, in some countries speaking from Serbia, it's, it's uh, more expensive than living on, on cheap meat and so on. So, um, you know, how, how do we explain that recycling makes microplastics, for example, or it's not true, but that's what I found out and so on and so on. So this is my call for DM25 members to internally have more of these uh, discussions, uh, taking aside ideology ideologies or the, the small differences that we all have as leftists and uh, to try to bring our message across in a less abstract and frightening way. Thank you, Ivana. Two quick comments from the chat from Kat Terrell. She says, green means corporate, no matter what you think. And Constance Aaron says, why would you expect that a one issue party, even the Greens, would be aggressive across the board? So with that, we're going to wrap up. Um, I would invite you all. I interviewed last week. It wasn't two weeks ago. Uh, Jojo Mehta, she's the uh, founder of the Stop ecocide initiative which is trying to criminalize um uh, destroying nature it's another uh, way of tackling climate change and very interesting so the interview is uh, is on our dm25 youtube channel please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified uh, if you're interested in that it's a related topic Thank you to all our speakers and to you out there for listening. And if you'd like to be part, as Ivana said, part of the solution to some of these issues that we've been talking about today, and I know we've, we've discussed a lot and there's a lot of open threads, but if you'd like to help to knit them together into some kind of impactful action, then there's only one address. It's dm25.org slash join. And in a few minutes, you can become a member. Thank you again to all of you and see you again at the same time.